Hobson's Choice by Harold Brighouse, with Wilfred Pickles as Horatio Hobson, Bernard Cribbins as William Mossop, and Barbara Young as Maggie. 22, 23, 24, two plain, one pearl. Oh, it's you. I hoped it was father going out. No, it isn't. Oh, he is late this morning. He got up late. Has he had his breakfast yet, Maggie? Breakfast? With the Masons meeting last night. Oh, he'll need reviving. Then I wish he'd go and do it. Are you expecting anyone, Alice? Yes, I am, and you know I am. And I'll thank you both to go when he comes. Well, I'll oblige you, Alice, if father's gone out first. Only you know I can't leave the counter till he goes. Oh, good morning, Miss Alice. Good morning, Mr. Prosser. Uh, father's not gone out yet. He's late. Oh. Oh, well, in that case... What I'll... can we do for you, Mr. Prosser? Oh, well, I can't say that I came in to buy anything, Miss Hobson. This is a shop, you know. We're not here to let people go out without buying. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just have a pair of boot laces, please. What size do you take in boots? Eights. I've got very small feet. <laughs> Does that make a difference to the laces? It makes a difference to the boots. Sit down, Mr. Prosser. Oh, uh, yes, but you see, it's I... It's time you had a new pair. These up is a disgraceful for a professional man to wear. Oh, Number well. eight from the third rack, Becky, please. Mr. Prosser didn't come in to buy boots, Maggie. I wonder what does bring him in here so often. I'm terribly hard on boot laces, Miss Hobson. Do you get through a pair a day? He must be strong. I keep a little in stock. It's as well to be prepared for accidents. And now he'll have the boots to go with the laces, Mr. Prosser. How does that feel? Oh, yes, very comfortable. Try it standing up. Yes, that fits all right. I'll put the other on. Oh, no, I really don't want to buy them. Sit down, Mr. Prosser. You can't go through the streets in odd boots. Uh, what's the price of these? A pound. A pound? Oh, no. They're good boots. And you don't need to buy a pair of laces today because we give them in as a discount. Uh, braid laces, that is. Of course, if you want leather ones, you being so strong in the arm and breaking so many pairs, you can have them. Only it's too small. Uh, no, these, these will do. Very well. You'd better have the old pair mended, and I'll send them home to you with the bill. Well, if anyone had told me I was coming in here to spend a pound, I'd, I'd have called them crazy. It's not wasted. Those boots will last. Good morning, Mr. Prosser. G good morning. Maggie, we know you're a pushing saleswoman, but... It'll teach him to keep out of here a bit. He's too much time on his hands. Do you know why he comes? I know it's time he paid a rent for coming. A pair of laces a day is not half enough. Coming here to make sheep's eyes at you. I'm sick of the sight of him. It's all very well for an old maid like you to talk. But if father won't have us go courting, I mean, well, where else can I but meet me except here when father's out? If he wants to marry you, why doesn't he do it? Courting must come first. It needn't. Maggie, I'm just going out for a quarter of an hour. Yes, father. Don't be late for dinner. There's liver. Why, it's an hour off dinner time. So that if you stay more than an hour in the Moonraker's Inn, you'll be late for it. Moonraker's will lose him. If your dinner's ruined, it'll be your own fault. Well, I'll Don't be... Don't swear, father. No. I'll sit down instead. Listen to me, you three. I've come to conclusions about you, and I won't have it. Do you hear that? Interfere with my goings out and comings in, the idea. I've a mind to take measures with a lot on you. I expect Mr. Healer's waiting for you in the Moonraker's father. He can go on waiting. At present, I'm addressing a few remarks to the rebellious females of this house, and what I say will be listened to and heeded. Providence has decreed that you should lack a mother's hand at the time when single girls grow bumptious and must have somebody to rule. But I'll tell you this, you'll non rule me. I'm sure I'm not bumptious, Father. Yes, you are. You're pretty, but you're bumptious. I hate bumptiousness like I hate a lawyer. If we take trouble to feed you, it's not bumptious to ask you not to be late for your food. Give and take, Father. Ah, well, I give and you take, and it's going to end. How much a week do you give us? That's neither here nor there. At the moment, I'm on uppishness. And I'm warning you, your conduct towards your father's got to change. But that's not all. That's private conduct. And now I pass to broader aspects and I speak of public conduct. I've looked upon my household as they go about the streets and I've been disgusted. The fair name and fame of Opson have been outraged by members of Opson's family. And uppishness has done it. I don't know what you're talking about. Vicky, you're pretty, but you can lie like a gas meter. Who had new dresses on last week? I suppose you mean Vicky and me. I do. We shall dress as we like, Father, and you can save your breath. I'm not stopping in from my business appointment for the purpose of saving my breath. You like to see me in nice clothes. I do. I like to see me dealt as nice. That's why I pay Mr. Tudsbury the draper ten pound a year ahead to dress you proper. It pleases the eye and it's good for trade. But I'll tell you, if some women could see themselves as men see them, they'd have a shock. And I'll have word with Tudsbury and all for letting you dress up like guys. 
I saw you and Alice out at Moonraker's Parlor a Thursday night. You were going down Chapel Street with a hump added to nature behind you. Ah. Aye, and the hump was wagging. Oh. And you put your feet on pavement as if you got chilblains. Aye, stiff neck above and weak knees below. It's immodest. It's not immodest, Father. It's the fashion to wear bustles. Then to hell with the fashion. Father, you're not in the Moonrakers now. You should open your eyes to what other ladies wear. If what I saw on you is any guide, I should have noted kind. Well, do you want us to dress like mill girls? No. They're like French madams, neither. It's on English, I We say. should continue to dress fashionably, Father. Then I've a choice for you two. Vicky, it's you I'm talking to, and Alice. You'll become sane if you're going to go on living here. You'll control this uppishness that's growing on you, and if you don't, you'll get out of this and exercise your gifts on someone else than me. Why, you don't know when you're well off. But you'll learn it when I've done with you. Aye. I'll choose a pair of husbands for you, my girls. That's what I'll do. Can't we choose husbands for ourselves? I've been telling you for the last five minutes you're not even fit to choose dresses for yourselves. You're talking a lot to Vicky and Alice, Father. Where do I come in? You? If you're dealing husbands round, don't I get one? Well, that's a good one. <laughs> you with a husband. Why not? Why not? Well, I thought you'd get sense enough to know. But if you want the brutal truth, you're past the marrying age. Hey, you're a proper old maid, Maggie, if ever there was one. I'm 30. Ah, 30 and shelved. Well, all the women can't get husbands, but you others now. I've told you, I'll have less uppishness from you, or else I'll shove you off my hands onto some other men. I can just choose which way you like. I'm off. One o'clock dinner, Father. See you, Maggie. I set the hours in this house. It's one o'clock dinner because I say it is, and not because you do. Yes, Father. Well, now then, as long as that's clear, I'll I'll go. Oh, no, I won't. Mrs. Epworth's just got out of her carriage. Good morning, Mrs. Epworth. What's a lovely day. Morning, Hobson. I've uh, come about those boots you sent me home. Oh, yes, Mrs. Epworth. <clears throat> well, now, they look very nice. Get off your knees, Hobson. You look ridiculous on the floor. Who made these boots? We did our own make. Will you answer a plain question? Who made these boots? They were made on the premises. Uh, young woman, you seem to have some sense when you served me. Can you answer me? I think so, but I'll make sure for you, Mrs. Hepworth. Uh, Toby? You wish to see the identical workman, madam? I said so. I'm responsible for all work turned out here. I never said you weren't. Yes, Miss Maggie? Uh, now, my man, did you make these boots? No, ma'am. Then who did? Am I to question every soul in the place before I find out? Uh, the Willie's making no. Then tell Willie I want him. Uh, certainly, ma'am. Willie? What? Who's Willie? Name of Mossop, madam. But if there's anything wrong, I assure you, I'm capable of making the man suffer for it. Will Mossop, come up. Now, are you Mossop? Yes, Mum. You made these boots? Yes, I, I made them last week. Oh, well, take that. Eh? Uh, oh. My visiting card. Oh. See what's on it? Uh, writing. Well, read it. Um, I'm trying. Mrs. Uh, he, he. Oh, bless yeah. the man. Can't you read? Well, I, I, I do a bit, only... It's such funny print. It's the usual italics of a visiting card, my man. Now, listen to me. I heard about this shop, and what I heard brought me here for these boots. I'm particular about what I put on my feet. I assure you it shall not occur again, Mrs. Hepworth. What shan't? Well, I don't know. Then hold your tongue. Mossop, I've tried every shop in Manchester, and these are the best-made pair of boots I've ever had. Now... You'll make my boots in future. You hear that, Hobson? Yes, madam, of course he shall. You'll keep that card, Mossop. Yes, mum. And you won't dare leave here to go to another shop without letting me know where you are. Oh, he won't make a change. How do you know? The man's a treasure, and I expect you underpay him. That'll do, Willie. You can go. Yes, sir. Bless my soul, he's like a rabbit. Can I take your order for another pair of boots, Mrs. Hepworth? Not yet, my dear. But I shall send my daughters here. And mind you, that man's to make the boots. Certainly, Mrs. Hepworth. Good morning. Good morning, Mrs. Hepworth. Very glad to have the honour of serving you, madam. 
Oh, we some people that mind their own business. What does your other praise a workman to his face for? I suppose he deserved it. Deserved, be blowed. Making them uppish, that's what it is. Last time she puts a foot in my shop, I'll give you my word. Don't be silly, Father. Oh, I'll show her. Thinks she owns the earth because she lives at Hope Hall. Well, that's a bit of a startler. Hmm? No. Morning, Jim. You're doing a good class trade if the carriage folk come to your observe. Really? Well, wasn't that? Mrs. Epworth? Oh, yes, Mrs. Epworth's an old and valued customer of mine. Mm. It's funny you deal with Hope Paul and never mentioned it. Oh, well, I've made boots for her and all the circles for how long, Maggie? Oh, I don't know. You kept it dark. Well, uh, aren't you coming round yonder? Yes, uh, that is no. A yell? No. Get away, you girl. Go oh, on. Oh, I'll look after Chop. Oh, I want to talk oh, to Mr. Oh, Ely. Come on, Well, can't you talk in the moon, right? What, with Sam Minns and Denton and Tudsbury there? Oh, it's private, then. What's your trouble, Henry? They're the trouble. All three of them. Do your daughters worry you, Jim? No. They mostly do as I bid them. And the missus does the leathering if they don't. Uh, Jim, a wife's a handy thing. You don't know it proper till she's taken from you. I felt grateful for the quiet when my Mary fell on rest, but I can see my mistake now. I used to think I were very hard put to it to fend her off when she wanted someone to answer me. But the dominion of one woman is paradise to the dominion of three. Mm, sounds a sad case, Henry. I'm a talkative man by nature, Jim. Well, you know that. You're an orator, Henry. I doubt John Bright himself is better gifted of the gab than you. <laughs> nay, nay, that's putting it a bit too strong. A good case needs no flattery. Well, you're the best debater in the Moonraker's parlour. Aye, well, that's no more than the truth. Yes, Jim, in the estimation of my fellow men, I give forth words of weight. In the eyes of my daughters, I'm a windbag. No, no. no I am. Um, they scorn me wisdom, Jim. The answer back. They want a firm hand, Henry. Well, I've lifted up my voice and roared at them. Ah, beware of roaring at women, Henry. Roaring is mainly all old sound. It's like trying to defeat an army with banging drums instead of cold steel. And it's steel in a man's character that subdues the women. I've tried always. I'm fair moithered. I don't know what to do. Then you quit roaring at them and get them wed. No, I will have thought of that. Trouble is to find the men. Men's common enough. Are you looking for angels, he breaches? I'd like my daughters to wed temperance, young men, Jim. You keep your ambitions within reasonable limits, Henry. You've three daughters to find husbands, so. Two, Jim, two. Two? Well, Vicky and Alice are mostly wind dress in its shop, but Maggie's too useful to part with. And she's a bit on the ripe side for marrying, is our Maggie? I've seen them do it at double her age. Still, leaving her out, you've two. One'll do for a start, Jim. It's a thing I've noticed about wenches. Get one wedded in the family and it goes through lot like measles. Well, you want a man and you want him temperance. It'll cost you a bit, you know. Hmm? Oh, I'll get me hand down for the wedding, all right. A warm man like you'll have to do more than that. There's things called settlements. Settlements? Ah. Uh -huh. You have to bait your hook to catch fish, Henry. Then I'll none go fishing. But you oh, I've changed my mind. I'd a fancy for a bit of peace, but there's luxuries a man can buy too dear. Oh, settlements indeed. I had a man in mind. You keep him there, Jim. I'll rub along and chance it's settlements. Oh, ho, ho. you saved a keep. They work for that, and there's none of them big eaters. And the wages. Wages. Do you think I pay wages to my own daughters? I'm not a fool. And it's all off. From the moment that you breathed the word settlements, it was dead off, Jim. Oh, let's go to moonrakers and forget there's such a thing as women in the world. Shop! Shop! I'm going out, Maggie. Dinner's at one, remember? Dinner will be when I come in for it. I'm master here. Yes, father. One o'clock. Oh, come on, Jim. Dinner at half past one, girls. We'll give him half an hour. Right, Maggie. Here. Now for a talk with Willie. <laughs> Willie, come here. Yes, Miss Maggie? Come up and put the trap down. I want to talk to you. We're very busy in cellar. Close the trap door. <laughs> Show me your hands, Willie. Oh, oh, no, they're dirty. Yes, they're dirty, but they're clever. They can shape the leather like no other man's that ever came into the shop. Who taught you, Willie? Well, I'm Miss Maggie, I, le I learnt my trade here. Hobson's never taught you to make boots the way you do. Well, I've had no other teacher. And needed none. 
You're a natural-born genius at making boots. It's a pity you're a natural fool at all else. Well, I'm not much good at out but leather, that's a fact. When are you going to leave Hobson's? Leave Hobson's? But I thought I gave satisfaction. Don't you want to leave? No, no, not me. I, I've been at Hobson's all my life and I'm not for leaving till I'm made. I said you were a fool. Well, then I'm a loyal fool. What keeps you here? Is it the people? Well, I don't know what it is. Well, I'm used to being here. Do you know what keeps this business on its legs? Eh? Two things. One's the good boots you make that sell themselves. The other's the bad boots other people make and I sell. We're a pair, we'll moss up. Oh, you're a wonder in the shop, Miss Maggie. And you're a marvel in the workshop. Well? Well what? It seems to me to point one way. What way is that? You're leaving me to do the work, my lad. Yeah, um... Well, I'll, I'll be going back to my stool, Miss Maggie. Come here. Eh? You'll go back when I've done with you. I've watched you for a long time. And everything I've seen, I've liked. I think you'll do for me. What way, Miss Maggie? Will Mossop, you're my man. Eh? Six months I've counted on you and it's got to come out sometime. But I never... I know you I... never. Or it'd not be left to me to do a job like this. Yeah, I think I'll sit down. I... I'm feeling queer-like. Hey, what does want me for? To invest in. You're a business idea in the shape of a man. I've got no head for business at all. But I have. My brain and your hands will make a working partnership. Oh, a partnership? Well, well, that's a different thing. I, I thought you were asking me to wed you. I am. Uh, you won't my gum. And you the master's daughter. Maybe that's why I will muss up. Maybe I've had enough of father. And you're as different from him as any man I know. Well, it's a, it's a bit awkward, like. And you don't help me any, lad. What's awkward about it? Well, you talking to me like this. I'll tell you something, Will. It's a poor sort of woman who'll stay lazy when she sees her best chance slipping from her. I'm your best chance? You are that, Will. Well, by gum. And I, I never thought of this. Think on it now. Yeah, I, I am doing. Only the blow's a bit too sudden to think very clear. I have a great respect for you, Miss Maggie. You're a shapely body and you're a masterpiece at selling in the shop, but, well, when it comes to marrying, I'm bound to tell you I'm not in love with you. Wait till you're asked. I want your hand in mine and your word for it that you'll go through life with me for the best we can get out of it. We'd not get much without there's love between us, lass. I've got the love, all right. Well, I've not, and that's honest. We'll get along without. Are you desperate set on this? It's a puzzle to me always. What did your father say? He'll say a lot, and he can say it. It'll make no difference to me. I'd much better not upset him. It's not worthwhile. I'm judge of that. You're going to wed me, Will. Oh, no, I'm not. No, no really, I, I can't do that, Maggie. I can see I'm disturbing your arrangements, like, but I, I'd be obliged if you put this notion from you. When I make arrangements, my lad, they're not made for upsetting. Well, what makes it so desperate awkward is I'm tokened. You what? I'm tokened to Ada Figgins. Then you'll get loose and quick. Who's Ada Figgins? Do I know her? I'm the lodger at her mother's. The scheming hussy. It's not that sandy-haired girl who brings you dinner. She's golden-haired, is Ada. And she'll be here soon. And so shall I. I'll talk to Ada. I've seen her. I know the breed. Ada's the helpless sort. Well, she needs protecting. That's how she got you, was it? Yes, I can see her. Clinging round your neck till you fancied you were strong. But I'll tell you this, my lad. It's a desperate poor kind of a woman that'll look for protection to the likes of you. Well, Ada does. And that gives me the weight of her. She's born to meekness, Ada is. You wed her and you'll be an 18 shillings a week bootmaker all the days of your life. You'll be a slave and a contented slave. Well, I'm not ambitious that I know of. No, but you're going to be. I'll see to that. Oh. I've got my work cut out, but there's the makings of a man about you. Oh, I wish you'd leave me alone. You're my man, Willie Mossop. I saw you, sir, but Ada would tell another story, though. Here she is now. Hello. Hello. There's your dinner, Will. Thank you, Ada. Ada? I want a word with you. You're treading on my foot, young woman. Me, Miss Hobson. What's this with you and him? Oh, Miss Hobson, it is good of you to take notice like that. Ada. You hold your rush. This is for me and her to settle. Take a fair look at him, Ada. At will. Not much for two women to fall out over, is there? Maybe he's not so much to look at, but you should hear him play. Play? Are you a musician, Will? 
I play the Jew's harp. That's what you see in him, is it? A gawky fella that plays the Jew's harp. I see the lad I love, Miss Hobson. It's a funny thing, but I can say the same. You? That's what I've been trying to tell you, Ada. By gum, she'll have me from you if you don't be careful. So we quit so far, Ada. You pardon me, you've spoke too late. Will and me's tokened. That's the past. It's the future that I'm looking to. What's your idea for that? You mind your own business, Miss Hobson. Will Mossop's no concern of thine. That's what I tried to tell her myself, only she will have it. It's no use. Not an atom. I've asked you for your idea of Willie's future. If it's a likelier one than mine, I'll give you best and you can have the lad. I'm trusting him to make the future right. It's as bad as I thought it was. Willie, you wed me. It's daylight robbery. Hey, Ada, why aren't you going to put up a better fight for me than that? Well, you're fair giving me to her. Well, Mossop, you take your orders from me in this shop. I've told you, you'll wed me. Seems like there's no escape. And wait while I get you to own my lad. I'll set my mother on to you. Oh, oh, so it's her mother made this match. Well, she had above a bit to do with it. I've got no mother, Will. You need none, neither. Well, can I sell you a pair of clogs, Miss Figgins? No, nor anything else. Then you've no business here, have you? Good morning. Will... Are you going to see me ordered out? Well, it's her shop, Ada. You mean I'm to go like this? Well, she means it. It's cruel hard. When it comes to a parting, it's best to part sudden and no whimpering about it. I'm not whimpering and I'm not parting neither. But he'll whimper tonight when my mother sets about it. That'll do. Will moss up, I'm telling you. You'll come home tonight to a thick ear. Hey, hey. <laughs> I'd really rather wed Ada Maggie if it's all the same to you. Why? Because of her mother? Well, she's a terrible rough side to her tongue, as Mrs. Figgins. Are you afraid of her? Well, yes. You needn't be. Yeah, but you don't know her. She'll jaw me till I'm black in the face when I go home tonight. You won't go home tonight. Not go? You've done with lodging there. Eh? You'll go to Tubby Waddlow's when you knock off work, and Tubby will go round to Mrs. Figgins for your things. Uh, and I'm not to go back there and never know more? No. <laughs> it's like a happy dream. Hey, Maggie, you do manage things. And while Tubby's there, you can go round and see about putting the bands up for us two. Bands? Hey, well, I'm hardly used to the idea yet. You'll have three weeks to get used to it in. Now you can kiss me, Will. Well, that's forcing things a bit and all. It's like saying I agree to everything a kiss is. Yes. Well, I don't agree yet. I... Come along. Dinner's nearly ready. Do what I tell you, Will. Oh, now? With, with them here? Yes. Oh, no. No. I, no, no, I, I couldn't. What's the matter with Willie? He's a bit upset because I've told him he's to marry me. Oh. Is dinner cooking nicely? You're going to marry Willie Mossop? Willie Mossop? You've kept it quiet, Maggie. Oh, look here, Maggie. I mean, what you do touches us, and you're mistaken if you think I'll own Willie Mossop for my brother-in-law. Is there supposed to be some disgrace in it? Disgrace? You asked father. And look at me. I, I, I don't survive Albert Prosser till this happened. You'll marry Albert Prosser when he's able. And that'll be when he starts spending less on laundry bills and air cream. Ooh. Well, what about that dinner? It'll be ready in ten minutes. You said one o'clock. Yes, father. One for half past. If you'll wash your hands, it'll be ready as soon as you are. I won't wash my hands. I don't know with such finicking ways, and well, you know it. Father, have you heard the news about our Maggie? News? There is no news. It's same old tale, opishness. You'd keep a starving man from the meat he earns in the sweat of his brow, would you? I'll put you in your place. Don't lose your temper, Father. You'll maybe need it soon when Vicky speaks. Uh, what's Vicky been doing? Nothing. It's about Will Mossop, Father. Will? Yes. What's your opinion of Will? Yeah, decent lad. I've noted against him that I know him. Would you like him in the family? Whose family? Yours. I'm going to marry Willie, Father. That's what all the fuss is about. Marry? You, Mossop? You thought me past the marrying age. I'm not. That's all. Didn't you hear me say that I'd do the choosing when it came to a question of husbands? You said I was too old to get a husband. Yeah, you all are. Oh, Father. And if you're not, it makes no matter. I'll have no husbands here. Oh, but you said... I've we... changed my mind. I've learned some things since then. There's a lot too much expected of my father nowadays. There'll be no weddings here. Oh, Father. Go and get my dinner but... served and talk less. Go on now, and not at rate temper to be crossed. Oh, but, Father. Now, go on, go on. Oh. You and I'll be straight with one another, Father. I'm not a fool, and you're not a fool. And things may as well be put in the place as is left untidy. I tell you, my mind's made up. You can't have Willie Mossop. While as his father was a workhouse brat, a cumbie chance. It's news to me with snobs in Salford. I'll have Willie Mossop, 
I've to settle my life's course, and a good course too, so think on. Gee, I'd be the laughing stock of the place if I allowed it. I won't have it, Maggie. Wait, it's, it's hardly decent at your time of life. I'm 30, and I'm marrying Willie Mossop. And now I'll tell you my terms. You're in a nice position to state terms, my lass. You will pay my man, Will Mossop, the same wages as before. And as for me, I've given you the better part of 20 years of work without wages. I'll work eight hours a day in future, and you'll pay me 15 shillings by the week. Do you think I'm made of brass? You'll soon be made of less than you are if you let Willie go. And if Willie goes, I go. That's what you've got to face. Hey, I might face it, Maggie. Shop hands are cheap. Cheap ones are cheap. The sort you'd have to watch all day. I'm value to you. So's my man. And you can boast it at the Moonrakers that your daughter Maggie's made the strangest, finest match a woman's made this 50 year. And you can put your hand in your pocket and do what I propose. I'll show you what I propose, Maggie. <coughs> Will Mossop, I can't leather you, my lass. You're female and exempt, but I can leather him. Come up, Will Mossop. Yes, Mr. Hobson. Now, then. You've taken up with my Maggie, are you? No, I've not. She's done the taking up. Well, Willie, either way, you've fallen on misfortune. Love's led you astray. I feel bound to put you right. Now, then, you see this strap? Hey, Maggie, what's this? I'm watching you, my lad. Mine, Willie, you can keep your job. I don't bear malice. But we must beat the love from your body. And every morning you come here to work with love still sitting in you, you'll get a leather in. You'll not beat love in me. You're making a great mistake, Mr. You'll Robson. put aside your weakness for my Maggie if you have a liking for a sound skin. You'll waste a great little lot of brass at chemists if I'm at you for a week with this belt. I'm no wanting that, Maggie. It's her that's after me. But I'll tell you this, Mr. Robson. If you touch me with that belt, I'll take her quick. Aye, and stick to her like glue. There's no but one answer to that kind of talk, my lad. <laughs> and I've no but one answer back. Maggie, I've no one kissed you yet. I shook before, but by gum, I'll kiss you now. I'll take you and hold you. And if Mr. Robson raises up that strap again, I'll do more. I'll walk straight out of this shop with thee, and us two will set up for ourselves. Willie, I knew you had it in you, lad. I knew you had it in you. <laughs> oh, heck. <laughs> Sure, I, I don't know what to tell you to do, Toby. Well, there's no in at all to start on, Miss Alice. We worked up. Well, father's out, and I can't help you. He'll play old Harry if he comes in and finds us doing out at workroom. The high class trades dropped like a stone this last month. Of course, we can go on making clogs for stock if you like. And you'd better. You know what's got by selling clogs won't pay rent, let alone wages. But if clogs are your orders, Miss Alice. You suggested it. I made the remark. But I'm not a rash man, and I'm not going to be responsible to master with his temper so out and all since Miss Maggie went. Oh, dear. What would Miss Maggie have told you to do? Yeah, I couldn't tell you that, Miss, I'm sure. I don't recollect things being as slack as this in her time. You don't help us much for an intelligent foreman. When you've told me what to do, I'll use me intelligence and see it's done properly. Then go and make clogs. Them's your orders? Yes. Uh, thank you, Miss Alice. I wonder if I've done right. That's your lookout. Oh, I don't care. It's father's place to be here to tell them what to do. Well, Maggie used to do without him. Oh, yes, go on. Blame me that the place is all at sixes and sevens. I don't blame you. I know as well as you do that it's father's fault. Well, he ought to look after his business himself instead of wasting more time than ever in the Moonrakers. But you needn't be so snappy with me about I'm it. I'm not snappy in myself. It's these figures. I can't get them right. What's 17 and 25? Fifty-two, of course. Well, it doesn't balance right. Oh, I wish I was married and out of it. Yes, same here. You? Well, you needn't think you're the only one. Oh, you are a sly one, Vicky Hobson. You've kept it all to yourself. Yes, just as well now that I did. Maggie's spoilt our chances forever. Nobody's fretting to get Willie Mossop for a brother-in-law. Maggie, you here? I just thought I'd drop in. Vicky, what's this that Mr Beanstock here has been telling me about you and him? If he's told you, I suppose you know. She got it out of me, Vicky. I don't know that it's any business of yours, Maggie. You'll never get no father with it by yourself, from what I hear of father's carryings on. Well, that's your fault, yours and Willie's. Leave that alone. I'm here to help you. 
if you'll have my help. It's very good of you, Miss Maggie, I must say. Your father's turned very awkward. I reckon he'll change. Has your young man been in yet this morning? Yes. My young man? Albert Prosser. No. Do you expect him? Well, he's not been here so often since you and Willie Moss. Since when? Since you made him buy that pair of boots he didn't want. Oh, I see. He didn't like paying for taking his pleasure in our shop. Well, if he's not expected, somebody must go for him. Prosser, Pilkington and Prosser. Solicitors of Bexley Square. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Albert's and Prosser. Aye. Quite a big man in his way. Will you go and fetch him then, Mr Beanstock? Tell him to bring the paper with him. You're ordering folk about a bit. I'm used to it. It's all right, Vicky. Is it? I mean, suppose Father comes in and finds Albert and Freddie here. He won't. Well, he's beyond his time already. I know. He must have worried Father very badly since I went out. Why? Tell them, Mr Beanstock. Well, the fact is, Mr Hobson won't come because he's at our place just now. At your corn warehouse? What's Father doing there? He's... he's sleeping, Vicky. Sleeping? You see, we've a cellar trap in our place that opens on the pavement, and your father wasn't looking very carefully where he was going, and he fell into it. Fell? Is father hurt? He's snoring very loudly, but he isn't hurt. He fell soft on some bags. Now you can go for Albert Prosser. Is that all what to be told? It's all there is to tell till Freddy's seen his solicitor. I'll not be long. Don't. I have a job here for you when you get back. Oh, Willie, there you are. Yes, Maggie. Hello. I don't know what you're aiming at, Maggie, the but... The difference between us is that I do. I always did. It's a queer thing you aimed at. I've done uncommon well myself. And I've come here to put things straight for you. Father told you to get married and you don't shake. He changed his mind. I don't allow for folks to change their minds. He made his choice. He said, get married and you're going to. You haven't made it easier for us, you know. Meaning Willie? Well, it wasn't my fault, Miss Vicky. Really, it wasn't. You call her Vicky, Will. No, he doesn't. He's in the family. Or going to be. And I'll tell you this. If you want your Freddy, and if you want your Albert, you'll be respectful to my Willie. Willie Mossop was our boot hand. He was. And you let bygones be bygones. He's as good as you are now and better. Uh, Nick, come, Maggie, Better, I... I say. The shop assistants. You're your own master, aren't you? Well, I've got my name wrote up on windows, but I don't know so much about being master. This is his business card. William Mossop, practical boot and shoemaker, 39A Oldfield Road, Salford. William Mossop. Master bootmaker. That's the man you're privileged to call by his Christian name. Ah, and I'll do more for you than let you call him by his name. You can both of you kiss him oh. for your brother-in-law to be. No, Maggie, I'm, I'm no great hand at kissing. I've noticed that. A bit of practice will do you no harm. Oh. Come along, Vicky. But, but Maggie, a, a shop of your own. I'm waiting, Vicky. I, I don't see you ought to drive her to it, Maggie. You hold your ass. But uh, however, did you manage it? I mean, where did you get the capital from? It came. Will stand still. Well, She's making up her mind to well, it. Well, I'd just as lief not put her to the trouble. You'll take your proper place in this family, my lad. Trouble or no trouble. Mm. I don't see why you should always get your way. It's just a habit. Come along now, Vicky. I have a lot to do today and you're holding everything back. It's under protest. Protest, but kiss. Uh, Your turn now, Alice. I'll, I'll do it if you let me with these books, Maggie. Books? Father's put you in my place? Yes. Then you must take the consequences. Your books aren't my affair. Oh, I think you might help me, Maggie. I'm surprised at you, Alice. I really am after what you've just been told. Exposing your books to a rival shop. You ought to know better. Will's waiting. And you're to kiss him hearty now. Oh, very well. <laughs> hey, there's more in kissing nice young women than I thought. Don't get too fond of it, my lad. <laughs> well, I hope you're satisfied, Maggie. You've got your way again. And now perhaps you'll tell us what you want in this shop. Eh? Are you trying to sell me something? I'm asking you. What's your business here? I've told you once. Will and me's taking a day off to put you in the way of getting wed. Oh, it looks like things are slow at your new shop if you can walk round in your best clothes on a working day. Well, it's not a working day with us. It's, it's a wedding day. You've been married this morning. Not us. I'll have my sisters there when I get wed. It's at one o'clock at St. Philip's. But we can't come. We can't leave the shop. Why not? His trade's are brisk. No, but... Not so much high-class trade doing with you, eh? Oh, I don't see how you knew. I'm good at guessing. You'll not miss out by coming with us to church, and we'll expect you at home tonight for a wedding spread. It's asking us to approve. You have approved. You've kissed the bridegroom, and you'll go along with us. Father's safe where he is. And the shop? Toby can see to the shop. Oh, that reminds me. You can sell me something. There are some rings in this drawer here, eh, Vicky. Brass rings? Yes, I want one. This? But you're not taking it for Yes, I am. Will and me aren't throwing money round, but we can pay our way. Now, there's fourpence for the ring. 
a gammony top, Vicky. Why did with a brass ring? Hmm. This one'll do. That's a nice fit. Well, I'd think shame to myself to be married with a ring like that. When folks can't afford the best, they have to do without. Oh, I take good care. I never go without. Semi-detached for you, I suppose, and a house full of new furniture. Haven't you furnished? Partly, what? We've made a start at the flat iron market. Oh, I'd stay single sooner than have other people's cast-off sticks in my house. Where's your pride gone to, Maggie? I'm not getting wed to help the furnishing trade along. I suppose you'd turn your nose up at second-hand stuff too, Vicky. I'd start properly or not at all. Then you'll neither of you have any objections to my clearing out the lumber room upstairs. We brought a handcart round with us. You made sure of things. Yes. Get upstairs while I've told you what to bring. Wait a bit. Go on. Let me tell you that if you claim the furniture from your old bedroom, that it's my room now, and you'll not budge a stick of it. I expected you'd promote yourself, Alice. But I said lumber room. There's a two or three broken chairs in the attic and a sofa with the springs all gone. You'll not tell me they're of any use to you. Nor to you, neither. Will's handy with his fingers. He'll put in this afternoon, mending them. They'll be secure against you to come and sit on them at supper time tonight. And that's the way you're going to live, with cast-off furniture. Aye, in two cellars in Old Field Road. Old oh, Field Road? Two of them, Alice. One to live and work in and the other to sleep in. Oh, well, it did not suit me. Oh, nor me. It suits me fine. And when me and Will are richer than the lot of you together, it'll be a grand satisfaction to look back and think about how we were when we began. Hello. Put the chairs on the handcart, Will. Right, go, Maggie. And remember... If you want my plan for you to work, you'll just think on. All I'm taking off you is some crippled stuff that isn't yours. And what I'm getting for you is marriage portions. What? Marriage portions, Maggie. You'd better put your hats on now. You'll be late for the church. But, but aren't we to know You'll first? know all right. Be quick with your things now. Come on in, Albert. Good morning, Albert. Have you got what Freddie asked you for? Uh, yes, but I'm Shall afraid... Shall I get the sofa now, Yes, I... yeah. Never mind being afraid... Freddy, I told you I had a job here for you. You go upstairs with Will. There's a sofa to come down. Get your coat off to it. Now then, Albert. But... I've told you what to do, and you can't do it in your coat. If that sofa isn't here in two minutes, I'll leave the lot of you to tackle this yourselves. And a nice hash you'll make of it. All right, Maggie. Here's the paper you wanted, Maggie. Do you call this English? Legal English. I thought it wasn't the sort we talk in Lancashire. What is it when you've got behind the weir asses and the seds and to wits? It's what you told Freddie to instruct me. Action against Henry Horatio Hobson for trespass on the premises of Jonathan Beanstock and Company, corn merchants of Chapel Street, Salford, with damages to certain corn bags caused by falling on them and further damages claimed for spying on the trade secrets of the aforesaid J.B. and Company. Well, I'll take your word that it means that. I've made this out to your instructions, Miss Hobson. But I'm far from saying it's good law, and I wouldn't be keen on going into court with it. Nobody asked you to. It won't come into court. Here's a sofa, Maggie. Oh, open that door for them, Albert. What's the time? You can see the clock from there. It's a uh, quarter to one. <gasps> Girls, if you're late for my wedding, I'll never forgive you. Put your coats on. Now then, Freddy, you take that paper and put it on my father in your cellar. Now? Now? Yes, of course, now. We might wait in any time. Well, you look fast enough. Aren't I to come to the church? Yes, if you do that quick enough to get there before we're through. All right. Oh, now, there's that handcart. Are we to take it with us? To church? You can't do that. Well, I'll take it home. And have me waiting for you at the church? That's not for me, my lad. Well, you can't very well leave it here. No. There's only one thing for it. You'll have to take it to our place, Albert. Me? There's the key. It's 39A Oldfield Road. What? Me pushing a handcart through Salford in broad daylight? Oh, dirty your collar. This will suppose some of my friends see me. Look here, my lad. If you're too proud to do a job like that, you're not the husband for my sister. Well, it's just the look of the thing. Well, can't you send somebody else? No. You can think it over. <coughs> Tubby? Yes, miss? Why, it's Miss Maggie. Come up, Tubby. You're in charge of the shop. We'll all be out for a while. Uh, I'll be up in half a minute, Miss Maggie. Well, Albert Prosser? Oh, yes, I suppose I must. That's right. We'll call it your wedding gift to me. And I'll allow you putting yourself out a bit for me. All right, Maggie. Well, Will, you've not had much to say for yourself today. 
How's it feeling, lad? Aye, Maggie, I'm going through with it. Hey? My mind's made up. I'm, I've got wrought up to the point and I'm ready. It's church we're going to, not dentists. Yeah, I know. You get rid of someone at dentists, but he's taking someone on to go to church with a wench, and the Lord knows what. So they will. I've a respect for church. Yon's not the place for lies. The parson's going to ask you, will you have me? And you'll either answer truthfully or not at all. If you're not willing, just say so now. Will I'll you? tell him yes. And truthfully? Yes, Maggie. I'm resigned. You're growing on me, lass. I'll tow the line with you. We're ready, Maggie. And time you were. It's not your weddings that you're dressing for. Come up, Chubby, and keep an eye on things. Well, have you got the ring? I have. Do you think I'd trust him to remember? <laughs> It's a very great pleasure to us to see you here tonight. It's an honour you do us, and I assure you, speaking for for my wife, <laughs> as well as for myself, that the... Um, generous. Oh, oh, that's it. That the generous warmth of the sentiment so cordially expressed by Mr Beanstock and so enthusiastically seconded... Oh, no, I've got that the wrong road round. Uh, expressed by Mr. Prosser and seconded by Mr. Beanstock <laughs> will never be forgotten by either my life partner or self. And I'd like to drink this toast to you in my own house. Our guests. And may they all be married soon themselves. <laughs> Our guests. A very <laughs> big speech indeed. Who taught you Will? I've been learning a lot lately. I thought that speech never come natural from Will. I'm educating him. Very apt pupil, I might say. <laughs> He'll do. <laughs> Another 20 years, and I know which of you three men will be thought most of at the bank. Hmm. Well, that's looking ahead a bit. I'll admit it needs imagination to see it now. Well, the start's all right, you know. Snug little rooms, shop of your own. I was wondering where you raised the capital for all this, Maggie. I? You mustn't call it my shop. It is. Do you mean to tell me that Willie found the capital? He's the saving sort. He must be if you've done this out of what father used to pay him. Well, we haven't. Not altogether. We've had help. Ah. It's a mystery to me where you got it from. Same place as those flowers, Albert. Oh. Hothouse flowers, I see. Mm, I was wondering where they came from. Same place as the money, Albert. Ah. Well, I, I think we ought to be getting home, Maggie. I shouldn't marvel. I reckon Tubby's a bit tired of looking after the shop by now. And if father's waiting, oh, don't it. I'm a bit nervous. He'll have an edge on his temper. Come on, put your hats on. Willie, we'll right. need this table when they're gone. You'd better be clearing the pots away. Yes, Maggie. But you're clearing the pots. <laughs> <laughs> and you and Fred can just lend him a hand with the washing up, Albert. Uh, me? Wash pots? Oh, Maggie, we're guests. I know. Only Albert laughed at Willie. And washing up will maybe make him think on that it's not allowed. Come on, girls, get your things on. Uh, hey, Freddy, are you going to wash up the pots? Are you? Uh. What would you do in our place, Will? Well, please yourselves, I'm going on with what she told me. Well, you're married to her, we aren't. What do you leave the table for in such a hurry? Oh, no, I'm not in any hurry myself. Maggie wants it for something. Well, it'll be for my lessons, I reckon. She's schooling me. And don't you want to learn, then? Well, it isn't that. I, I just don't want to be rude to you, you know, turning you out so early. I don't see you need to go away so soon. Why not? Well, I'm fond of a bit of company. Do you want company on your wedding night? Well, I don't favour you going so soon. He's afraid to be alone with her. That's what it is. He's <laughs> shy of his yes. wife. Ah, ah, that's a fact. I've, I've not been married before, you see. I've not been left alone with her either. Up to now, she's been coming round to where I lodged at Tubby Wadlow's to give me my lessons. Well, it's different now. And I freely own I'm free the would like. I, I'd be deep if you would stay on a bit to help to thaw the ice for me. You've been engaged to her, haven't you? Ah, but it weren't for long. And you see, Maggie's not the sort you get familiar with. You've had quite long enough to thaw the ice. It's not our job to do your melting for no. you. No. Uh, Fred, those pots need washing. Uh, we'll wash them. Fred, would you like it yourself with a, 
with a wench like Maggie. Well, that's not the point. It wasn't me she married. It's that being alone with her that worries me. Well, I did think you'd stand by a fellow man to make things not so strange at first. That's not the way we look at it. Mm. Hurry up with the cup spread. Have you broken anything yet, Albert? Broken? No. Too slow, I expect. I must say, you don't show much gratitude. Aren't you at all surprised to find us doing this? Surprised? I told you to do it. Yes, but... You can stop now. I'll finish when you're gone. Who's that? Someone who can't read, I reckon. You own that card, Aunt Dorwell. Aye, it's there, and you wrote it, Maggie. I knew better than to trust it to you. Business suspended for the day, it says. And they that can't read it can go on knocking. Aye, Maggie. His father. No. What's the matter? Are you afraid of him? Well, I, I think all things considered. And, all and see... right, we'll consider them. You can go into the bedroom, the lot oh, of you. Right. No, not you, Willie. Oh. The rest. Oh. I'll shout when I want you. When he's gone. It'll be before oh. he's gone. But we don't want to go. Is this your house or mine? It's your cellar. And I'm in charge of it. Go on, all of you. Come on. Hey, Ma Maggie. Maggie. I'll open the door. You sit still. And don't forget your begaffer here. Oh, hey. Well, Maggie. Well, Father. I'll, uh, I'll come in. Well, I don't know. I'll have to ask the master about that. Hey, the master? You and him didn't part on the best of terms, you know. Will, it's my father. Is it to come in? Aye, let him come. You don't sound cordial about your invitation, young man. No, but I am. I'm right down glad to see you, Mr. Hobson. It, it makes the wedding day complete like you being a father and all, and I... Well, I hope you'll see your way to staying here a good long while. Well, That's enough, Willie. Don't... A piece of pork pie now, Mr. Robson. Oh, pork pie. You'll be sociable now you're here, I hope. It wasn't sociability that broke me, Maggie. What was it, then? Maggie, I'm in disgrace. A sore and sad misfortune's fallen on me. Happen a piece of wedding cake will do you good. Oh, it's sweet. That natural in cake. Oh, dear, I've got such a head. Aye. Uh, but wedding cake's a question of heart. There'd be no bride's cakes made at all if we thought first about our heads. I'm quite aware it's foolishness, but I've a wish to see my father sitting at my table eating my wedding cake on my wedding day. It's a very serious thing I've come about, Maggie. It's not more serious than knowing that you wish as well. Well, Maggie, you know my way. When a thing's done, it's done. You've had your way and you've done what you wanted. I'm none proud of the choice you've made, and I'll not lie and say I am. For I've shaken your husband's hand, and that's a sign for you. The milk's spilt, and I'll not cry. Then there's your cake, and you can eat it. I'll give you my word there's no ill feeling. So now we'll have the deed. Eat it. Oh, you're a hard woman. You have no consideration for the... for the weakness of old age. Finish? Do oh, pass me that tea. Oh, that's easier. Now, tell me what it is you came about. I'm in sore trouble, Maggie. Then I'll leave you with my husband to talk it over. Eh? You'll not be wanting me. Women are only in your way. Maggie, you're not going to desert me in the hour of my need, are you? Surely, thank goodness, you don't want a woman to help you after all you've said. Willow do his best, I make no doubt. Give me a call when you're finished, Will. Maggie, it's private. Why, yes, I'm going. And you can discuss it man to man with no fools of women about. I tell you, I've come to see you, not him. It's private from him. Private from Will? Nay, it isn't. Will's in the family. And you've no to say to me that can't be said to him. I'll to tell you this with him there. Will and me's one. Sit you down, Mr. Robson. You call him father now. Do I? Does he? He does. Sit down, Will. Now, if you're ready, Father, we are. What's the matter? This is a piece of paper. That's the matter. Mm, it's an action for damages for trespass, I see. It's a stab in the back. It's an unfair, un-English, cowardly way of taking a mean advantage of a casual accident. Did you trespass? Maggie, I say it solemnly. It's all your fault. I had an accident, I don't deny it. I'd been in Moonrakers and I'd stayed too long. And why? Why had I stayed too long to try to forget that I'm a thankless child? To erase from the tablets of memory the recollection of your conduct. That was the cause of it. And the result, the blasting, withering result. I fell into that cellar. I slept in that cellar and I woke to this catastrophe. Lawyers, law costs, publicity, ruin. I'm still asking you. 
Was it an accident? Uh, did you trespass? It's an accident as plain as Salford Town Hall. It's an accident. But they that live by law of twisted ways are putting things that make white show as black. I'm in the grip at last. I've kept away from lawyers all my life. I've hated lawyers. And they've got that chance to make me bleed for it. I've dodged them. And they've caught me in the end. Oh, they'll squeeze me dry for this. My word, that's somewhat like a squeeze and all. I can see it, serious. I shouldn't wonder if you didn't lose some trade from this. Wonder it's as certain as Christmas. My good class customers are not going to buy the boots from a man who stood up in open court and had to acknowledge he was overcome at 12 o'clock in the morning. They'll not remember it was private grief that caused it all. They'll only think the worst of me because I couldn't control my daughter better than to let her go and be the cause of sorrow in my old age. And that's what you've done. You've broke this on me, you two, between you. Do you think it'll get into the paper, Maggie? Yes, for sure. You'll see your name in the Salford Reporter, Father. Salford Reporter, yes, and more. Gee, by God, think of that. Why, it's very near worthwhile to be ruined for the pleasure of reading about yourself in a printed paper. It's there for others to read besides me, my lad. Why, oh, oh, you're right, I didn't think of that. This'll give a lot of satisfaction to many I could name. Other people's troubles is mostly what folks read the paper for. And I reckon it's twice the pleasure to them when it's the trouble of a man they know themselves. Hear you talk, it sounds like a pleasure to you. Oh, no, 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 no it's not. No, you've ate my wedding cake and you shook my hand. We're friends, I hope, and I would not but meditating like a friend. I always think it's best to look on the worst side of things. First, then whatever chances can't be worse than you look for. Oh, there's, uh, there's St. Philip's now. I don't suppose you'll go on being vicar's warden after this to do. And it brought you a powerful lot of customers from the church, did that? I'm getting a lot of comfort from your husband, Maggie. It's about what you deserve. Have you any more consolation for me, Will? Well, I only spoke what came into my mind. Well, have you spoken it all? Well, I can keep my mouth shut if you'd rather. Don't strain yourself, Will Mossop. When a man's mind is full of thoughts like yours, they're better out than in. Let them come, my lad. They'll leave a cleaner place behind. Well, I'm not much good at talking, and I always seem to say wrong things when I do talk. I'm sorry if my well-meant words don't suit your taste. But I thought you came here for advice. I didn't come to you, you jumped-up cock That'll open. do, Father. My husband's trying to help you. Yes, Maggie. Now, about this accident of yours. Yes, Maggie. It's the publicity that you're afraid of most. It's been dragged into a court of law. Told me that's voted right all through my life and been a sound supporter of the Queen and Constitution. Then we must try to keep it out of court. If there are lawyers in heaven, Maggie, which I doubt, they may keep cases out of court there on earth. A lawyer's job's to squeeze a man and squeeze him where he's squirming, seen the most, in court. I've heard of cases being settled out of court, in private. In private, I, I dare say. And all the worse for that, it's done amongst themselves in lawyers' offices, behind closed doors, so no one can see this squeeze in twice as hard in private as they dare to do in public. The summary is straight demanded by a public place, but privately. It'll cost a fortune to settle this in private, my gate. I make no doubt it's going to cost you something. But you'd rather do it privately than publicly. If only it were not in the lawyer's office. You can settle it with the lawyer out of his office. You can settle it with him here. Albert? Uh, yes, Mrs. Mossop? This is Mr. Prosser, of Prosser, Pilkington and Prosser. He is? Yes. You're a lawyer? Yes, I'm a lawyer. At your age. Come out, all of you. Hello, Hello Father. Alice, Vicky. Family gathering. This is Mr. Beanstalk of Beanstalk and Company. Uh, how do you do? What? Here? When you've got a thing to settle, you need all the parties to be present. But there's so many of them. Where they all come from? My bedroom. Yeah. Maggie, I wish you'd explain before my brain gives way. It's quite simple. I got them here because I expected you. You expected me? Yes. You're in trouble. Look, what's it got to do with Alice and Vicky? What are they doing here? Hey, what's happening to Chop? Toby Wadlow's looking after it. When is it Toby's job to look after Chop? Well, he's got no other job. The shop's so slack since Maggie left. And do you run that shop? Do you give orders there? Do you decide where you can put your hats on and walk out of it? They came out because it's my wedding day, Father. It's reason enough. And Will and me will do the same for them. We'll close the shop and welcome on their wedding days. Their wedding days. That's a long time off. It'll be many a year before there's another wedding in this family, I'll give you my word. One doubt to define me is quite enough. Hadn't we better get to business, sir? Young man, 
Don't abuse a noble word. You're a lawyer. By your own admission, you're a lawyer. Honest men live by business. Lawyers live by law. In this matter, sir, I'm following the instructions of my client, Mr. Beanstalk. And the remark you have just let fall before witnesses appears to me to bear a libelous reflection on the action of my client. What? So it's libel now? Isn't trespass and spying on trade secrets enough for you? You blood. One moment, Mr. Hobson. You can call me what you want. And I shall. But I wish to remind you in your own interest that abuse of a lawyer is remembered in the costs. Now, my client tells me he is prepared to settle this matter out of court. Personally, I don't advise him to do this because we should probably get higher damages in court. But Mr. Beanstalk has no desire to be vindictive. He remembers your position, your reputation for respectability. How much? I beg your pardon? I'm not so fond of the sound of your voice as you are. What's the figure? Uh, the sum we propose, which will include my ordinary costs, but not any additional costs incurred by your use of defamatory language to me, is one thousand pounds. What to a thousand pounds for tumbling down a cellar? Why, I might have broken my leg. That is in the nature of an admission, Mr. Hobson. Our flower bag saved your legs from fracture, and I'm therefore inclined to add to the sum I have stated a reasonable estimate of the doctor's bill we have saved you by protecting your legs with our backs. Me, Albert Prosser. I can see you're going to get on in the world. But you needn't be greedy here. That one thousand's too much. We thought... Then you can think again. But... If there are any more signs of greediness from you two, there'll be a counteraction for personal damages due to your criminal carelessness in leaving your cellar flap open. Maggie, you've saved me. I'll bring that action. I'll show them up. You're not damaged. And one lawyer's quite enough. But he'll be more reasonable now. I know perfectly well what father can afford to pay, and it's not a thousand pounds, nor anything like a thousand pounds. No, not so much as you can't afford, Maggie. You'll make me out a pauper. You can afford five hundred, and you're going to pay five hundred. Oh, but there's a difference between affording and paying. You can go to the courts and be reported in the papers, if you like. It's the principle I care about. I'm, I'm being beaten by a lawyer. Father, dear, how can you be beaten when they wanted a thousand pounds, and you're only going to give five hundred? No, I hadn't thought of that. It's there you were beaten. Oh, well, I'd take a good few beatings myself at that price, Vicky. Still, I want this keeping out of court. Uh, then we can take it as settled. Do you want to see the money before you believe me? Is that your nasty lawyer's way? Not at all, Mr. Hobson. Your word is as good as your bond. It's settled. It's settled. Hooray! Well, I don't see what you have to cheer about, Vicky. I'm not to be dragged to public scorn. Well, you know, this is a tidy bit of money to be going out of the family. It's not going out of the family, Father. Well, I don't see how you make that out. Their wedding day is not so far off as you thought. Now there's the half of £500 apiece for them to make a start on. You mean to tell me... You won't forget you passed your word, will you, Father? I've been diddled. It's a bit like... It takes two daughters off your hands at once and clears your shop of all the fools of women that used to lumber up the place. It'll be much easier for you without us in your way, Father. Aye, and you can keep out of my way and old. Do you hear that? All on you. Father. I'll run that shop with men, and I'll show Sulphur how it should be run. Don't imagine there'll be room for you when you come home crying and tired of your fine husbands. I'm rid of you, and it's a lasting riddance, mind. I'll pay this money you've robbed me of, and that's the end of it. All on you. And you especially, Maggie. I'm not blind yet. I can see you it is who I've got to thank for this. Don't be vicious, Father. Will Mossop. Huh? I'm sorry for you. Take you for all in all, yet best at bunch. You're a backward lad, but you know your trade. And it's an honest one. So does my Albert know his trade. Oh, I'll grant you that. He knows his trade. He's good at robbery. Oh, Father. Ah, you may father me. But that's a piece of work I've finished with. I've done with fathering. I'm there beginning it. They'll know what marrying a woman means before so long. They're putting chains upon themselves and have thrown the shackles off. I've suffered 30 years and more, and I'm a free man from today. Lord, what a thing you're taking on, you poor, poor wretches. You red-nosed robbers, but you're going to pay for it. It's a funny honeymoon. You'd better arrange to get married quick. Alice and Vicky will have a sweet time with him. Can they go home at all? Why not? After what he said? He'll not remember half of it. It's for the moonrakers now, if there's time. What is the time? Time we were going, Maggie. You'll be glad to see the back of us. No, no, I, I, I wouldn't dream of asking you to go. Then I would. Oh. It's high time we turned you out. There you are. Good night. Oh. Good night, Vicky. Good night. Good night, Maggie. Good night. Good night, Alice. Good night, Maggie. And thank you. Oh, that. I'll see you again. Only don't come round here too much because Will and me's going to be busy. 
And you may be fine enough to do yourselves with getting wet. Oh, I dare say. Send us word when the day is. Uh, we'll be glad to see you at the wedding. We'll come to that. You'll be too grand for us afterwards. Oh, no, Maggie. Well, and we'll be catching up with you before so long. We're only starting here. Good night. Good night, Maggie. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Now you've heard what I've said of you tonight. In 20 years, you're going to be thought more of than either of your brothers-in-law. I heard you say it, Maggie. And we're to make it good. Mm. I'm not a boaster, Will. And it's to be in less than 20 years and all. Well, I don't know. They've got a long start on us. And you've got me. Your slate's in the bedroom. Bring it out. Right, all. I'll have this table clear by the time you come back. Off with your Sunday coat now. You don't want to make a mess of that. Hey, whatever are you doing with that muffin rag? Oh, we're going to wash out what's on the slate. Let's see it first. That's what you did last night at Tubby's after I came here. Yes, Maggie. There is always room at the top. Your writing's improving, Will. I'll set you a short copy for tonight because it's getting late and we've a lot to do in the morning. Great things grow from small. Now then, you can sit down here and copy that. I'll put these flowers of Mrs. Epworth behind the fire, Will. We'll not want litter in the place come working time tomorrow. You're saving one. Oh. Now, I thought I'd press it in my Bible for a keepsake, Will. Oh. I'm not beyond liking to be reminded of this day. Hey, Lord, I'm tired. I reckon I'll leave them pots till morning. It's a slackish way of starting, but I don't get married every day. No. I I'm from my bed. You'll finish that copy before you come? Yes, Maggie. Great things grow from small. G R A T. Straight up to him, Tubby. He's getting up, Mr. Ealer. Getting up? Oh, you, you I told he... you what he told me to tell you. Run for Dr. MacFarlane, he said, and I rang for Dr. MacFarlane. Now go for Mr. Ealer, he said, and tell him I'm very ill, and I came and told you. Then he said he'd get up and I was to have his breakfast ready for him and he'd see you down here. Nonsense, Tubby, of course I'll go up to him. Hey, you know what he is, sir. I'll get blamed if you're going. He's short-tempered this morning. I don't want to get you into trouble, Tubby. Thank you, Mr. Ealer. I quite thought it was something serious. Well, if you ask me, it is. Well, which way? Well, every way you look at it. Mr. Robson's not his own old self, and shop's not its own old self, and just look at me. Mm -hmm. Now I ask you, Mr. Ealer, man to man, is this work for a foreman's shoe hand? Cooking and laying By tables? By all accounts, there's not much else for you to do. Yeah, there's better things than being housemaid, even if it's only making clogs. They told me clogs are a cut line. Ah, well, what are you to do? There's no else wanted. Hobson's in a bad way, and I'm telling no secret when I say it. It's a fact that's known. It's a thousand pities with an old established trade like this. Ah, and who's to blame? Well, they say in Chapel Street it's Willie Mossop. Yeah, Willie's a good lad, though I say it, that trained him. He hit us hard, did Willie, but we'd have got round that in time. Mm. Oh, with care, you understand, and tact. <laughs> tact. That's what Gaffer lacks. Hey, now, uh, Miss Maggie me. now, well, she's a marvel. Aye, a fair knockout. Not slavish, mind you. Stood up to customers all the time, but she'd away with her that sold the goods and made them come again for more. Look at us now. Men assistants in shop. Costs more than women. Cost? They'd be dear at any price. Look here, Mr. Ealer, take yourself. When you go to buy a pair of boots, do you like to be tried on, be a man or a, a nice, soft young woman? <laughs> Well, <laughs> uh, there you are. Stands to reason. It's human nature. Well, there are two sides to that, Tubby. Look at the other. Ladies? Yes. Uh, ladies that are ladies want trying on by their own sex, and then that aren't by clogs. It's good class trade that pays, and Hobson's has lost it. Oh, well, Henry. Oh, Jim. 
Oh, Jim, oh, Jim. Uh, will you sit on the armchair a bit fire or at the table? Table, breakfast, bacon. Ooh, bacon, and I'm like this. When a man's like this, he wants a woman about the place, Henry. I'll want them. Uh, shall I go for Miss Maggie, sir? Mrs. Mossop, I mean. I think your daughter should be here. Ah, they should, but they're not. They're married and I'm deserted by them all and I'll die deserted. Ah, then perhaps they'll be sorry for the way they treated me. Till we have got you no work to do it, shop. I might find some if I looked Well, out. then go and look and take that bacon with you. I can't stand smell. Are you sure you wouldn't like Miss Maggie? I'll go oh, for her. Oh, go for her. Go for the devil. What does it matter who you go for? Hey, I'm a dying man. Uh, yes, sir. Now, what's all this talk about dying, Henry? Oh, Jim, oh, Jim. I, I've sent for doctor. We'll know soon now how near the end is. Well, this is very sudden. You've never been ill in your life. It's been saved up. It's all come now at once. What are your symptoms, Henry? I'm all one symptom at the foot. I'm frightened of myself, Jim. Yes. That's worst. You won't call me a clean man, Jim. Clean? Of course I would. Clean in body and mind. <laughs> oh, well, I'm dirty now. I haven't washed this morning. Couldn't face water. Only use I saw for water was to drown myself. Same with shaving. I've thrown my razor through window. Mm -hmm. I had to do it. I had to cut my throat. Oh, come, come. Oh, it's awful. I'll never trust myself again. I, I'm going to grow a beard if I live. You'll cheat the undertaker, Henry. But I fancy a doctor could improve you. What do you reckon is the cause of it now? Moonrakers. You, you don't think... I don't think I know. I've seen it happen to others, but I never thought it had come to me. No, me neither. Well, you're not a topper, Henry. I grant you are Adler, but you don't exceed. It's a hard thing if a man can't take a drop of ale without its getting back at him like this. Why, well, it might be my turn next. He is Dr. McFarlane. Good morning, gentlemen. Where's my patient? Uh, here. Here? Up? Uh, it looks like it. And for our patient who's downstairs, I'm made to rise from my bed at this hour. It's not as early as all that. But I've been up all night, sir. A young woman with her first. Are you, Mr. Hobson? It, but certainly not. No, I'm not ill. Hmm. <laughs> not much to choose between you. You've both got your fate written in your faces. Do you mean that I... I mean I'm... he has and you will. Huh? Doctor, will you attend to me? Yes. No, sir, let's feel your pulse. Oh, I've never been in a bad way before this morning. I've never needed a doctor in my life. You've needed, but you've not sent. But this morning... I know. Well. What? You know? Any fool would know. Eh? Any fool but one fool, and that's yourself. You're damn polite. If you want flattery, I dare say you can get it from your friend. I'm giving you my medical opinion. I want your opinion on my complaint, not on my character. Your complaint and your character are the same. Then you'll kindly separate them and you'll tell me what's I'll wrong. tell you nothing, sir. I don't diagnose as my patients wish, but as my intellect and sagacity direct. Good morning to you. But, but you've not diagnosed. Sir, if I am to interview a patient in the presence of a third party, the least that third party can do is to keep his mouth shut. After that, there's only one thing for it, Henry. He shifts that I do. Oh, well, you'd better go, Jim. There are other doctors, Henry. I'll keep this one. I've got to teach him a lesson. Scotchmen can't come over Salford, lads, this road. Well, if that's it, I'll leave you. That's it. <laughs> I couldn't bully as well as a foreigner. That's better, Mr. Hobson. Well, if I'm better, you've not had much to do with it. I think my calculated rudeness... If you calculate your fees at the same rate as your rudeness, they'll be high. I calculate by time, Mr. Hobson, so we'd better get to business. Will you unbutton your shirt? No anky-panky now. Aye. Oh, oh. Yes, it just confirms my first opinion. Oh, oh. You've had a breakdown this a.m.? Aye, uh, uh, you might say so. Melancholic? Depressed? Aye. Uh, question was whether Razor was going to beat me or me beat Razor. Well, I won that time. Razor's in yard. I'll never dare to try shaving myself again. And do you seriously require me to tell you the cause, Mr. Hobson? I'm paying the brass to tell me. Chronic alcoholism. If you know what that means. Aye. A serious case. I know it's serious. What do you think you're here for? It isn't to tell me so much I know already. It's to cure me. Very well. I will write you a prescription. Hey, stop that. 
I beg your pardon. I won't take it. None of your druggish muck for me. I'm particular about what I put into my stomach. Mr. Hobson, if you don't mend your manners, I'll certify you for a lunatic asylum. Are you aware that you've drunk yourself within six months of the grave? You'd a warning this morning that any sane man would listen to, and you're going to listen to it, sir. Well, I'll be taking your prescription. Precisely. You will take this mixture, Mr. Hobson, and you will practice total abstinence for the future. You ask me to give up my reasonable refreshment? I forbid alcohol absolutely. Mm, much good your forbidding is. I've had my liquor for as long as I remember, and I'll have it to the end. If I'm to be beaten, baby, I'll die fighting. You'll die fighting, will you? <laughs> it's a gay high-sounding sentiment, my money, but you'll no do it, do you hear? You'll no slip from me now I've got my grip on you. You'll die sober, and you'll live the longest time you can before you die. Have you a wife, Mr. Hobson? Up there. In bed? Higher than that. Ah, it's a pity. A man like you should keep a wife handy. Ah, well, I'm not so partial to women. Women are a necessity, sir. Have you no female relative that can manage you? Manage? You keep her thumb firm on you. I've got three daughters, Dr. McFarlane, and they tried to keep the thumbs on me. Well, where are they? Married. Uh, and queerly married. You drove them to it? They all grew uppish. Maggie, worst of all. Maggie? Then I'll tell you what you'll do, Mr. Hobson. You'll get Maggie back at any price. At all costs to your pride, as your medical man, I order you to get Maggie back. I don't know, Maggie, but I prescribe her. Oh, and... let me tell Damn you. sir, are you going to defy me again? I tell you, I won't have it. You'll have to have it. You're a dunderheaded lump of obstinacy, but I've taken a fancy to you, and I decline to let you kill yourself. I've escaped from the thrall of a women once. And, and a I'll... pretty mess you've made of your liberty. Now, this Maggie you mention. If you'll tell me where she's to be found, I'll just step round and have a crack with her myself. For I've gone beyond the sparing of a bit of trouble over you. You'll waste your time. I'll cure you, Mr. Hobson. Hey, she won't come back. Oh? No, that's a possibility. If she's a sensible buddy, I concur with your opinion that she'll no come back. But women are a soft-hearted race, and she'll maybe take pity on you after all. I want no pity. If she's the woman I take her for, you'll get no pity. You'll get discipline. Now, just a minute. Don't interrupt me, sir. I'm talking. I've noticed it. You asked me for a cure, and Maggie's the name of the cure you need. Maggie, sir, do you hear? Maggie! What about me? Uh, are you Maggie? I'm Maggie. You do? What are you doing under my roof? I've come because I was fetched. But who fetched you? Toby Wadlow. Toby can leave my shop this minute. Sit down, Mr. Hobson. No. He said you're dangerously ill. He is. I'm Dr. McFarlane. Will you come and live here again? I'm mad. I know that, Mrs. Uh, your father's drinking himself to death, Mrs. Mossop. Look here, Doctor. What's passed between you and me isn't for everybody's ears. I judge your daughter's not the sort to want the truth wrapped round with a feather bed for fear it hits her hard. Go on. I'd like to hear it all. Just nasty minded curiosity. I don't agree with you, Mr. Hobson. If Mrs. Mossop is to sacrifice her own home to come to you, she's every right to know the reason why. Sacrifice? If you saw her home, you'd find another word for that. Two cellars the Oldfield Road. I'm waiting, Doctor. I have a constitutional objection to seeing patients slip through my fingers when it's avoidable, Mrs. Mossop. And I'll do my best for your father, but my medicine will no do him any good without your medicine to back me up. He needs a tight hand in him all the time. I've not the same chance I had before I married. You'll have no chance at all unless you come and live here. I'll not talk about the duty of a daughter because I doubt he's acted badly by you. But on the broad grounds of humanity, it's saving life if you'll come. I might. Aye, but will you? You've told me what you think. The rest's my business. That's right, Maggie. That's what you get for interfering with folks' private affairs. So now you can go with your tail between your legs, Dr. McFarlane. On the contrary, I'm going, Mr. Hobson, with the profound conviction that I leave you in excellent hands. One prescription's on the table, Mrs. Mossop. The other two are total abstinence and you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Tubby? Uh, yes, Mrs. Mossop? Go round to Oldfield Road and ask my husband to come here and get this prescription made up at Hallows on your way back. Uh, yes, Miss. Mrs. Mossop. Tell Mr. Mossop I want him quick. Yes, Mrs. Mossop. Maggie, you know I can't be an abstainer, a man of my habits at my time of life. You can if I come here to make you. Are you coming? 
I don't know yet. I haven't asked my husband. You ask Will Mossop. Maggie, I'd better vote on you. Make it an excuse like that to me. If you want to come, you'll come to what Will Mossop says, and well, you know it. I don't want to come, Father. It's no gift to a married woman to come back to the home she's shut of. Now, look here, Maggie. You're talking straight, and I'll talk straight and all, and when I'm set, I'm set. You're coming here. I didn't want you when that doctor said it, but by gum, I want you now. It's been my doubt as I'll be crossing me. Now you'll come and look after me. All of us? No, not all of you. You're the eldest. There's another man with claims on me. I'll give him claims, aren't I, your father? And I'm not your only daughter. You've been here long, Maggie? A while. Oh, well, a fashionable solicitor's wife doesn't rise so early as the wife of a working cobbler. You'd be up when Toby came. A couple of hours earlier. You're looking all right, Father. You've quite a colour. I'm very ill. He's not so well, Alice. The doctor says one of us must come and live here and look after him. Well, I live in the Crescent myself. I've heard it was that way on. Somebody's home will have to go. Well, I don't think I can be expected to come back to this after what I've been used to lately. Alice! Well, I mean, I, I say it ought to be Maggie, Father. She's the eldest. And I say that you're as much Father, right... Father, you're ill. Oh, Vicky, oh. Vicky, my oh. baby. At last I found a daughter who cares for me. Of course I care. Don't the others? You'll come and live with me, Vicky, won't you? What? One of us is needed to look after him. Oh, but it can't be me. In my circumstances, Maggie. What circumstances? No. No. What's the matter? What are you all whispering about? Father, don't you think you ought to put a collar on before Will comes? Put a collar on for Will Mossop? There's something wrong with your sense of proportion, my girl. Maggie, you're always pretending to talk about your husband, but you needn't keep it up with us. We know Will here. Father, either I can go home or you can go and put a collar on for Will. I'll have him treated with respect. I expect you put a collar on in any case, Father. Well, of course I should. I'm going to put a collar on. But understand me, Maggie. It's not for the sake of Will Mossop. It's because my neck's cold. Now then, which of us is it to be? Well, it's no use looking at me like that, Maggie. I've told you I'm expecting. I don't see that rules you out. It might happen to any of us. Maggie, what's the matter? Children do happen to married women and we're all married. Well, I'm not going to break my home up and that's flat. My child comes first with me. I see. You've got a house of furniture and you've got a child coming, so Father can drink himself to death for you. That's not fair speaking. I'd come if there were no one else. You know very well it's your duty, Maggie. Duty? I should think it'd be a pleasure to live here after a year in a cellar. I've had 30 years of the pleasure of living with Father, thanks. Do you mean to say that you won't come? It isn't for me to say at all. It's for my husband. Oh, do stop talking about your husband. If Alice and I don't need to ask our husbands, I'm sure you never need to ask yours. Will Mossop hasn't the spirit of a louse, and we know it as well as you do. Maybe Will's come on since you saw him, Vicky. It's getting a while ago. There he is now in the shop. I'll go and put it to hey, him. stop her. Oh, let her do it in her own way. Well, I'm not coming back here. <laughs> no, me. There's only Maggie for it. Yes, but we've got to be careful, Alice. She mustn't have things too much her way. Hey, don't let's leave her too long with Will. She's only telling him what to say, and then she'll pretend he thought of it himself. Why, Will, are you coming into this? Ah, oh, that's a proposal, isn't it? Well, I didn't know it was. Now then, Maggie, go and bring your father down and be sharp. I'm busy in my shop, so what the art is. All right, Will. It's been a good business in its day, too, as Hobson's. What on earth do you mean it's a good business still? You try and sell it, you'd learn. Stock and goodwill would fetch about, what, 200. Oh, don't talk so foolish, Will. 200 for a business like Father's. 200, as it is. Nor as it was in our time, Vicky. Do you mean to tell me that Father isn't rich? If you'd not married into the law, you'd know what they think of your father today in trading circles. Vicky ought to know her husband's in trade. My Fred in trade? Well, isn't he? He's in the wholesale. That's business, not trade. And the value of father's shop is no affair of yours, Will Mossop. Oh, I thought maybe it was. If Maggie and me are coming You're here... You're coming here to look after father. Maggie can do that with one hand tied behind her back. I'll look after the business. You'll do what's arranged for you. I'll do the arranging, Alice. If we come here, we come here on my terms. There'll be fair terms. I'll see the fair to me and Maggie. Will Mossop, do you know who you're talking to? Ah, my wife's young sisters. Times have changed a bit since you used to order me about this shop, haven't they, Alice? Yes, and I'm Mrs Albert Prosser now. Ah, so you are, to outsiders. And you'd be surprised the number of people that call me Mr Mossop now. We do get on in the world, don't we? Some folks get on too fast. It's a matter of opinion. I know Maggie and me gave you both a big leg up when we arranged your marriage portions, but I don't know that we're grudging you the sudden lift you got. Oh, good morning, Father. 
I'm sorry to hear you're not so well. Oh, I'm a change, man, Will. Ah, there used to be room for improvement. Hear what? Sit down, Father. Ah, now, don't let's be too long about this. You've kept me waiting now a good while, and my time's valuable. I'm busy at my shop. Is your shop more important than my life? Well, that's a bit like asking if a pound of tea weighs heavier than a pound of lead. I'm worried about your life because it worries Maggie, but I'm no one worried that bad that I'll see my business suffer for the sake of you. If that isn't what I've a right to expect from you, Will. You've no right to expect I care whether you sink or swim. Will! Well, what's to do? You told me to take I hand, didn't you? And we're to stay here and watch Maggie and Will abusing Father when he's ill. There's no need for you to stay. That's a true word, Will Mussop. Father, you take his side against your own flesh and blood. That doesn't come too well from you, me girl. Now, I'd rather you leave your homes to come to care for me. You're not for me, so you're a we're me. not against your father. We want to stay and see that uh, we'll deal fairly by you, that's Oh, I right. see. I'm not capable of looking after myself, aren't I? I'm to be protected by you girls, lest I'm overreach and overreach by you. Be willy mossop. Well, I might be ailing, but I've fight enough left in me for a dozen such as him. And if you're thinking that the manhood's gone from me, you can go and think it's somewhere else than in my house. Oh, but father, dear father. Oh, I'm you... not so dear to you if you had to think twice about coming here to do for me, let alone jibbing at it the way you did. A proper daughter would have jumped. I skipped like a calf by the cedars of Lebanon at the thought of being helpful to her father. Did Maggie skip? She's a bit ancient for skipping, is Maggie, but she's coming round to reconcilement with the thought of living here, and that's more than you're doing, Alice, isn't it? Eh? Are you willing to come? No. Are you, Vicky? Well, it's my child, Never father. Never mind what it is. Are you for coming or not? No. Then you that aren't willing could leave me to talk with them that are. Do you mean that we're to go? I understand you've homes to go to. Oh, father. Open the door for him, Will. Uh, Vicky? Well, I don't know. We'll be glad to see you here at tea times on a Sunday afternoon if you'll condescend to come sometime. Oh, beggars on horseback. <laughs> now, my lad... I'll tell you what I'll do. Ah, we can come to grips better now there's no fine ladies about. Ah, they've got stiff necks with pride, and the difference between you and two of them's a thing I ought to mark, and a thing I'm going to mark. There's times for holding back and times for letting loose and being generous. Now, you come in here to this house, both on you, and you can have back bedroom for your own, and the use of this room split along with me. Maggie will keep house, and if she's time to spare, she can lend hand in the shop. I'm finding Will a job. You can come back to your old bench in the cellar, Will, and I'll pay you the old wage of 18 shilling a week, and you and me will go equal wax in the cost of the housekeeping. And if that's not handsome, well, I don't know what is. I'm finding your house, rent-free, and paying half keep of your wife. Come on, Maggie. I think I'll have to. Well, whatever's the hurry for? It may be news to you, but I have a business round in Oldfield Road. And I'm neglecting it with wasting my time here. Wasting time? Maggie, what's the matter with Will? I've made him a proposal. He's a shop of his own to see to, Father. A man who's offered a job at Hobson's doesn't want to worry with a shop of his own in a wretched cellar the Oldfield Road. Shall I tell him, Maggie, or shall we go? Go, go, if go. If he goes, I go with him, Father. You'd better speak out, Will. All right, I will. We've been a year in yon wretched cellar. And do you know what we've done? We've paid off Mrs. Epworth what she lent us for our start, and we've made a bit of brass on top of that. We've got your high-class trade away from you. That shop's a cellar, and as you say, it's wretched. But they come to us in it, and they don't come to you. Your trade's gone down till all you sell is clogs. You've got no trade. Me and Maggie's got it all. And now you're on your bended knees to her to come and live with you, and all you think to offer me is my old job at 18 shillings a week. Me, that's the owner of a business that's starving yours to death. But... But your will muss up my old shoe, Anne. Aye, I were. But I've moved on a bit since then. Your daughter married me and she set about my education. And now I'll tell you what I'll do. And it'll be the handsome thing and all from me to you. I'll close my shop. Oh, that doesn't sound like doing so well. I'm doing well, but I'd do better here. I'll transfer to this address and what I'll do that's generous is this. I'll take you into partnership and I'll give you your half share on the condition you're sleeping, partner, and you don't try interference on with me. A partner? You here? William Mossop, late Hobson is the name this shop will have. Wait a bit, Will, I don't agree to that. Oh, no. so you've piped up at last. I began to think you'd both lost your senses together. It had better not be late, Hobson. Well, I meant it should. Do you just wait a bit. I want to know if I'm taking this in right. I'm to be given a half share in my own business on condition I take no party run in it. Is that what you said? That's it. Well, of all the impetus I've heard all right, this Father. Is... But did you hear what he said? Yes, that's settled. Quite settled, Father. 
It's only the name we're arguing about. I won't have late Hobson. No, oh, I'm not dead yet, Miller. I don't know, shall we? I'm not. I think Hobson and Mossop is best. His name on my signboard. The best I'll do is this. Mossop and Hobson. No. Mossop and Hobson are its old field road for us, Maggie. Very well. Mossop and Hobson. Hey, oh, but... make some alterations in the shop and all. I will so. Alterations in my shop? In mine. Look at that chair. How can you expect the high-class customers to come and sit on a chair like that? Well, we'd only a cellar, but they did sit on Creton for the trying on. Creton, it's pampering folk. Creton for a cellar and Morocco for this shop. Folk like to be pampered. Pampering pays. There'll be a carpet on that floor, too. Carpet Morocco. Young man, do you think this shop's the same ten square Manchester? Not yet, but it's going to be. What does he mean? Look, it's no farther from Chapel Street to St. Anne's Square than it is from Oldfield Road to Chapel Street. I've done one jump in the year, and if I wait a bit, I'll do the other. Maggie, I reckon your father could do with a bit of fresh air after this. I dare say it's come sudden to him. Suppose you walk with him up to Albert Prosser's office and get Albert to draw up a deed of partnership. Oh, no. I'll go and get me out. He's crushed like, Maggie. I'm afraid I bore on him too hard. You needn't be. I said such things to him. And they sounded as if I meant them, too. Didn't you? Did I? Ah, I suppose I did. Ah, well, that's just the worst from me to him. You told me to be strong and use the power that's come to me through you, but, well, he's the old master. And You're the new. Master of Obsons. <laughs> it's an outrageous big idea. Did I sound confident, Maggie? You did all right. <laughs> I won't be half as certain as I sounded. Words came from my mouth that made me jump at my old boldness. And when it came to facing you about the name, I tell you, I fair trembled in my shoes. I was carried away like I wouldn't have dared cross you, Maggie. Don't spoil it, Will. You're the man I've made you. And I'm proud. Thy pride's not in the same street, lass, for the pride I've got in you. Ah, that reminds me. I've got a job to see to. What job? Oh, it's about the improvements. You'll not do what without consulting me. I'll do this, lass. What are you doing? You leave my wedding ring alone. Well, you've worn a brass one long enough. I'll wear that ring forever, Will. I was forgetting your proper one, Maggie. I'm not preventing you. I'll wear your gold for show. But that brass stays where you put it, Will. And if we get too rich and proud, we'll just sit down together quiet and take a long look at it so we'll not forget the truth about ourselves eh lad eh lass ready father come along to Albert's yes Maggie well by gum Hobson's Choice by Harold Brighouse, Horatio Hobson was played by Wilfred Pickles, Willie Mossop by Bernard Cribbins, and Maggie by Barbara Young. Alice was Anna Cropper, Albert John Normington, Tubby Graham Rigby, Jim Healer Henry Livings, and Dr. McFarlane Duncan McIntyre. Vicky was Carol Gar Gardner, Mrs. Hepworth Marion Dawson, Ada Figgins Elizabeth Bell, and Fred Beanstock Geoffrey Hinsliff. The play was first broadcast in 1962 and it was directed in Manchester by Alfred Bradley. <laughs>